the time when you need to prospect the most is when your pipeline is flush, when your pipeline is mature and you are working deals through and you're about to have one of your biggest months or biggest quarters in a long time. But it's also extremely common for sales professionals to look at their pipeline to say, I've got a bunch of deals coming. This is fantastic. This is what I work hard for. And to go focus on those deals and get complacent. Sales is not fair and sales is not easy. It's a lot of damn work. And there have been times when we haven't hit our number. And I think if I look back, it was because I thought a couple of deals that were going to close didn't close. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's biggest B2B sales show, where we help you not just hit your target, but really thrive in sales. If you haven't already, click subscribe and join Sales Nation. And with that said, let's meet today's guest. Hi, this is Matt Hines, founder and president of Hines Marketing, and we help companies build predictable sales pipelines. In this episode, you're going to learn why you're in a sales slump right now and how to get out of it. Super practical, what you need to do right now to get out of the sales slump, get your manager off your back to start crushing your numbers. And then when you're at that point, what you can do to stop falling into them in the future. And with that said, let's jump right in. Today, we're going to dive into sales slumps. And I want to set up this question because hopefully we'll get the answer of how to get through them, how to break past that later on in the show. But I want to set it up, set up the conversation with a, a question of, are sales slumps something that we should be seeing if the sales process, the complex B2B sales process is going succinctly from top of the funnel to the bottom? Or are they a indicator that something else is going wrong throughout our sales process and throughout our daily activities? I don't think it's absolute. It's a really good question. I don't think it's absolute. I think there are so many different factors that impact whether or not you can hit your number. Uh, you know, I started my business about 10 years ago. It was, you know, late 2008. You know, the, the global market had just started to tank a little bit. And so there were a lot of conditions outside of myself, outside of my client's business that were going to impact whether or not they hit their number. Uh, I do think all that said, you do find an awful lot of people have a slumps because they aren't filling their pipeline. I mean, it's that simple, but also that difficult is you have to always be prospecting. You have to always be building your pipeline. And the bigger, healthier your pipeline is, the less likely one or two deals that slip are going to dramatically impact whether or not you hit your number. Um, so I, you know, it's, it's easy to blame external factors for why you have, you hit a slump, but it's also easy to forget that you have an awful lot of control over what your pipeline looks like to mitigate those slumps that could happen. Okay, so, so this, is a, this is a question. It's been from four years of doing the podcast now. It's come up uh, multiple, multiple, multiple times. And, uh, and it's something I've experienced of when I haven't filled the pipeline in my sales roles, it's not just sales slumps. It's when sales becomes the horrible job of chasing that person at the end of the month because you need just one more deal and you, you feel like you've got to go twisting arms or giving discounts or your stress levels are rising because you, you, you're you clearly just kind of struggling, you're back and forth. Why don't we, and this is such an obvious question, but hopefully there'll be a profound answer to it. Why don't we continuously fill our pipeline when we know it kind of inextricably it's just so important? Well, I, I think that we focus on the urgent and not the important. You know, Stephen Covey's, you know, you know, habits of successful people tells us that we tend to chase the things that are fire drills in front of us. And when you're mid to late in the month or mid to late in the quarter, you tend to focus on the things that are going to help you get paid in that time period. And those are the deals in front of you. Um, and those take a lot of time and they're stressful and they're draining. And then when you focus on those first, you either run out of time in the day to do your prospecting or you think, you know what? Things are great. My pipeline's great. I'm going to hit my number this month. I can afford to relax. Relax. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with relaxing. But if you the, the time and I've, I've seen this time and time again <clears throat> in our own business, as well as with our clients, the time when you need to prospect the most is when your pipeline is flush, when your pipeline is mature and you are working deals through and you're about to have one of your biggest months or biggest quarters in a long time. That is when you need to prospect, because if you don't, by the time you get to the end of the quarter and some of those deals have closed, some of them have gone away, you've got nothing left. You know, over here in the States, we talk about, you know, talk about, you know, this in terms of uh, baseball teams. You may have a really great team in the major leagues, but most baseball teams have a minor league system where they'll have several, you know, teams uh, at different levels of players that are trying to get to the majors. And people talk about the strength of the minor league system. If you have traded away all your best prospects to get a couple of big leaguers that can help you win this year and you've got a really weak minor league system you've got a couple really bad years coming up because you don't have anybody that's going to fill the major league roster when those older players retire or start to diminish in value or to diminish in, in results themselves. So you, you have to continue to feed that pipeline. 
the key word I took away there, Matt, was as relax. Because I've done this. Mm. You're having that fantastic month. Or for me, I would be kind of paid bonuses year on year. Target would be anywhere, depending on the different companies I worked, work, worked for, from kind of 2 million to it's kind of 8, 9, 10 million, depending on the territory and all that kind of stuff. And I would always find, and now I kick myself when I look back at it, I'd find that I'd be up to 90, 85% of target. I'd have three or four months left and I'd know one big deal would would solve all my problems. And I would literally start slacking off. Whereas, and tell me if this is uh, kind of your experience, uh, kind of more anecdotal than just my kind of single experience. But my commissions got real serious after I hit target. I can't remember the numbers right now, but say around a number of I got 5% commissions up to that point. And after Target, it was like 15, 20% commissions. It, it wasn't those numbers, uh, but it was, you know, along along the lines of that scale. And I started relaxing because I thought, oh, damn, my, my boss isn't on my back anymore. This is nice and easy. I'll just go and hang out with my best customers. Whereas the I was in the role to make money. I enjoyed the products that we were selling, but you know, I was there to to make bank. And I was I was letting go and I was taking my foot off the pedal right at the moment when I should have been doubling down, right? Is this is this, um, is this experience common? Is this something that we can kind of project across some of the audience here? It's cr- it's crazy common. Absolutely. I think, you know, when you not only when you, you know, look, you, when you're in the middle of a, of a quarter or the month and you're trying to get your deals closed, I mean, it makes sense that you go and focus on getting those deals across the line. But it's also extremely common for you know, for sales professionals to look at their pipeline to say, I've got a bunch of deals coming. This is fantastic. This is what I work hard for. And to go focus on those deals and get complacent. And then to not say, you know what, I don't need to prospect as hard today. I can do more tomorrow. Or, you know what, after I get through these deals, I'll go prospect. It's fine. And then what you forget is that it actually takes a lot of time and a lot of work to get to that pipeline. It's not like, well, I'm going to make a couple phone calls and have pipeline again. Um, You may have a prospect that has the need that's the right person at the right company, but the timing might not be right. They may not be entering the pipeline at the time when you want them to. So, you know, like if if you go back and remember how hard it is to prospect, how much work it takes to build that pipeline. um, You know, I wonder if there's some way to sort of create some visual or visceral reminder of that. (laughs) This sort of says, I mean, maybe there's something you post, you know, in your office somewhere that says, like, here's how many calls it took to get to this pipeline. Mm -hmm. How many of you made this month? Right. And to show that, like, unless you go and do that work again, you're not going to have that pipeline. It's a it's a it's a common, common problem for that complacency. But uh, you have to fight it or else you're going to be on that roller coaster again. Yeah. And as we say this, I'm smiling. And and just for the audience to kind of keep us going here, because there's two things I want to dive into acutely what we do when there is a sale. So we're in the middle of it and we're going, oh, shit, and we're not going to hit our target and we're getting pestered. We'll cover that in a second. I feel like it's also worth covering how we keep the funnel full, what habits we need to introduce so that if people listening to this are not in a sales slump right now, how we can avoid getting into one. But we'll cover those two in a second. But this just literally just came to mind of, I sell the advertising space on the podcast. I've got kind of say four deals kind of qualified, conversations had, waiting on it, a yes or no. Three of them are probably going to come in. One of them is a kind of a maybe. And I dropped everything this morning because I got an email last night and I know the people who I'm going back and forth with, I won't name them just yet in case it doesn't come in, but they listen to the show. They want to sponsor the show for the next two years. They want to just take all the advent inventory for the next two years. Clearly the show is growing. So they're going to get a bargain out of it kind of 18 months, two years from now, because they'll be saving costs on the fact that um, I'm keeping the price set for them. But the urgent versus important is an interesting one here because it's subjective, right? Of I dropped all the other conversations I was having in the emails I wanted to get sent, or I record this on a, recording this on a Monday morning, I dropped all that to put a really, uh, to put my time into a proposal that went out today for this two year deal. And the, the context here and the conundrum here is now I'm behind on the smaller deals, but they might be irrelevant based on the fact that this one deal might come in. But if I don't close this one deal, I might've lost all my business, right? So how do we, in the grand scheme of sales, as it gets more and more complex, the the bigger the deal sizes that we're doing, Matt, how do we prioritize whether something is important or urgent? Well, let me preface this by saying sales is not fair, <laughs> and sales um, and sales is not easy. Um, it's a lot of damn work, um, and so you know if 
I can tell you from personal experience for myself, just in managing the pipeline of our business, you know, we're growing and so our pipeline has to be bigger and bigger to sort of feed the, literally feed the, feed the mouths of the people we have here and keep the business growing. And there have been times when we haven't hit our number. And I think if I look back, it was because I thought a couple of deals that were going to close didn't close. And, um, and that will happen. There will be, there will always be, you know, I saw that, you know, the, the company you're talking about, that sounds fantastic. And I hope that closes and that sounds like that'll be awesome. But, um, Sometimes things don't close. Sometimes things happen. I mean, literally the day I was waiting for a signature for a CMO one day, um, you know, he uh, uh, he, he they, they had a reorg and um, he was out of the company. I mean, if it would have been the day before the deal would have signed, the company would have had to sort of, you know, manage to work with us. Wow. Apparently. But, but um, so that deal just went away and I just kind of thought it was coming in. So, you know, yeah, you're just like, well. And especially as a services business, you're like, well, I can't if, if all the deals in my pipeline close, I'm screwed because I don't have the capacity for all of that. So I assume a certain conversion rate. Um, but I think a lot of times when you need certain deals to close, um, it's it's usually because you don't have enough quality pipeline behind them. You don't have enough other deals in the pipeline that accurately reflects the economics of your pipeline. And by economics of your pipeline, I mean, if you expect 20 percent of your qualified opportunities to close and you've got one deal on the hook that you think is going to close, like, do you really have four others that feel like that as well? Like, legitimately, do you have the numbers knowing that one of those is going to close? And if two closes, that's a nice problem to have to deal with that. But if you've been in sales long enough, you know that things that are a sure deal fall through. Like, if you don't have the backup, and I think that's another we talk about. You know, having that complacency of everything's fine. I'm going to close these deals. Um, you know, I, I want people to want to, to run around as nervous Nancy's, like thinking the world's going to fall apart. But um, like, you have to do something to continue to motivate yourself to keep that pipeline flush. I think the takeaway from this so far is have a post-it note on your table of how many deals, perhaps at the bottom of the funnel, that you need to get that conversion rate. And just to know your conversion rates. I, in medical device sales, when I look back, I have no idea what my conversion rates were. And we were doing deal sizes from five grand to kind of a, a million, two million pounds plus for a full theater refurbishment. I genuinely have no idea what the conversion rate was. And and yeah, maybe we should have. It, saying this, this was a, a billion dollar uh, company. It was privately owned that I worked for. We had no CRM system. So we, we weren't helping ourselves uh, on that perspective. So Matt, with, with that said, and I think that's really useful practical advice for Sales Nation there, let's move on to some more practical advice because there's going to be people who have clicked, downloaded, watching, streaming, viewing this video or audio because they saw the title, they saw that they're in a sales slump, they put two and two together and they're hoping this is the holy grail of content that's going to save their asses. What do we do if real acutely now we're in a sales slump, there's People on our backs, we're not sure about the pipeline. We're not sure about the numbers. Where should we start? We've got to break through this sales slump. Perhaps we've got a quarter to do it to give ourselves a context and a time frame. We're in a, we're in a sales slump. We've got a quarter to break through it. What are the first steps? What do we need to do? Well, there's a number of things you can do. I think that the two places I would focus uh, first is, you know, as much as possible, do not start from scratch. Find the prospect you've talked to in the past, the people that you've talked to that weren't ready, the people that were in your pipeline that, that sort of fell through. Start with the prospects that, are, that were already somewhere in your pipeline before it didn't close and find out where they're at. Right. And I mean, it's you know, we talk a lot in sales about just the power of follow up. Well, where are all those prospects? And the majority of them probably still aren't going to be ready to buy. But I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've found deals and we've had clients find deals just by following up with people that were marked as closed lost or closed nurture in CRM and that you just never go back to. Right. But if they didn't buy and if they didn't buy from someone else, they're still out there. So find the prospects that are um, not at square one. Uh, but two, I think just get going. I mean, just, you know, start, you know, building some activity, start making some phone calls. You know, you talked earlier about doing the math. I would do the work back to say, okay, to get a deal, I need to have this many opportunities. To get to an opportunity, I need this many leads. To get to qualified leads, I need this many activities. And, you know, it, 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 unless you can have a guarantee from marketing, your marketing team that they're going to give you some of those leads, you have to go do that yourself. So figure out how many of those calls you need to make. I mean, if you're really an anxious person, you can sit and say, well, I can, how many calls should I make today? Like, all of them. Well, that's not <laughs> realistic either. Um, but to say, hey, listen, I actually know I need to talk to 40 prospects a day. And by talk to, I can mean I'm going to make a phone call or I'm going to send a LinkedIn email or I'm going to cut a few personalized emails. 
But if 40 a day translates into conversion rate op- leads, conversion rate opportunity, conversion rate deals to hit your number, then go make your 40 calls today. And that also gives you a much more specific thing to do. When you're busy with your current deals, when you're having a kill it month, and it's a Tuesday and you're feeling kind of lazy, well, I'm not gonna go have a pint until I make those 40 calls. I still have to do 40 calls every day to make sure that next month I get to that 15, 20% commission rate as well. So I think in marketing, we'd be calling uh, the process of going from a, a closed or a, a non-closed or a nurtured um, individual as, as reactivating them. In sales, I know I've never really done this. I never really contemplated it. So this is good for, good news for me as well. And that's something I need to point to my kind of pipeline management. What do we need to do to go back to someone who said perhaps a, not a no, but they said no, not right now? What should that outlook uh, or outreach look like? Should this be an email? Should we, if we're in a slump, if we're if we're screwed, if we need to close these three or four more deals for the end of the month, should we forget email? It's too slow. Should we just be ringing them? And um, how do we engage in a conversation, Matt? of, hi, you weren't interested. Are you, are you interested in now? How, how do we have a better conversation than just opening with that? Well, from a channel standpoint, I think you go back to what worked in the past, right? I mean, I'll, I'll prospect, some prospects are better on the phone, better in email. I've got some that you never hear from them unless you text them and, they, and they're fine. That's just a more communication. Um, look, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's the middle of the month and you're trying to, and your, your pipeline sucks and you're trying to get new deals in your pipeline, you might just be kind of screwed, right? I mean, like there's there's only, I mean, seriously, like you're not going to call people you haven't talked to in four months and all of a sudden in 24 hours, they're going to be like, oh yeah, you're right, let's do this. Especially if it's a complex considered purchase. Um, I think when I think about going back to those deals that were closed nurture or closed for no reason, or they they didn't choose someone else, they just chose not to do anything. Um, you know, your follow-up is building future pipeline. That's probably not a short-term deal, but that's part of your prospecting. Uh, you know, I, for myself in our business, I have a, I have a, a, a have, habit set up where I'm taking some of those deals that just closed to nothing. Like they just didn't make a decision or they said, oh, you know what? We've got these other priorities we got to deal with first. Or, you know, what? we're going to try to do this internally ourselves. Um, you know, when they decide to do something else and they say, well, I think we've I think we're covered. It's a great time to follow up and say, well, were you were you covered? Have you actually made progress on that? Um, almost every one of those deals that closes to nothing. I make a calendar reminder to myself, you know, a month or two and, you know, later. Um, to, to follow up with them. But I also have a I have a set of a checklist that it periodically reminds me to go back to those closed nurture deals uh, and follow up to see where they're at. That's super smart. I like that. So we need to segment the kind of lost. We need to take our ego out of it because I know occasionally someone will tell me to you know, we'll do this better ourselves. We're going to I've had someone say to me not too long ago, hey, we're going to launch our own podcast because it'd be cheaper to do that than it would be to go with you. And I never followed up with them. Um, the, I know the guy kind of uh, off the, the record of, of business as well. Um, so I could very very easily give him a call and say, hey, how did that go for you? Because I know damn well no one can launch a podcast with our kind of size within kind of a year, two years, and and it costs cheaper than just sponsoring our show. So that, I'm, I'm jotting this down as we go through it because I'm going to take away some of these and use them myself, Matt. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually, I love it when, you know, if a prospect says, Hey, you know what? Um, you know, we're going to go this other direction, do it ourselves. Or, you know, if they choose a path that I look, I've seen this movie before, I'm pretty sure that's not going to work. You know, you're looking for a quick fix. There is no such thing you think there is. And so I, I actually love it because a, it, it, it stops me from wasting my time right now. If that prospect really does believe that a better way, a better way uh, is, is worthwhile, then I don't want to waste any more time with them right now because I'm just going to be rolling, rolling a rock uphill. But also it sets up a really fun follow up in two to three months because one of two things is going to happen at that point. Either they haven't made progress and they've learned to become a little more humble through that process and they're going to be willing to talk or it did work. And I want to learn from that because if they chose something that I was pretty sure was not going to work and it did work, I want to know why. And that conversation then elevates you, right, as, as an expert within the, the space, as an expert in the industry, someone who isn't just trying to shove a pitch down people's throats, maybe the second time around, if you ask some intelligent questions like you were portraying there, it immediately flips the table and it shows that you followed up and that you somewhat care about the individual. Perhaps yeah. then the sale comes even easier than it would have done the first time around. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know if the sale becomes easier because you still, I mean, you may start running into the same things around price and, um, you know, other things, you know, people have, you know, other things that now all of a sudden become urgent at that period of time. Um, so I think you still have some of those same kind of issues. Um, but I do think that, 
I don't know. I think if, if it, it allows both sides to approach something without the the immediate urgency to get something closed. I mean, if I'm just following up to see how something's going, the pretense of that call is not I'm trying to close you. It's 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 a it's a it's a is a genuinely interested follow up that the that the recipient typically appreciates the fact that we're still thinking about them. Yeah, I'm glad you framed it up like that because there's opportunity there for people to the audience to ring up and it's almost like a an aha moment of hey what you did sucked and should have come with us <laughs> so framing it up in a moment your way like you just described is clearly the the smart way to do it right one last thing on acute sales slumps and we're going to discuss how we can potentially avoid them is it ever worth and you know someone running a company um you you'll you'll have better context on this than me the lowly sales professional who's never been in management i manage people in my team now but I certainly don't have a, a big team and I certainly don't have the experience of kind of managing anyone who has a quota or anything like that. So hopefully you'll have more context on this than me. Say we like we're targeted each quarter because this might not work on a year. Is there ever a reason that if our pipeline is just sucks, we've screwed up, we've made a mistake, we've realized it and we've got two options. We've got one, keep keep ignoring the pipeline and try and close the low hanging fruit. And perhaps we're not going to hit target, but we can get up to that 80, 70, 80, 90% where we don't get sacked, but we get a telling off versus we just ignore this quarter. It's been a wash. We, we've, we've, we've messed up and we carry on prospecting. So the next two or three quarters are going to be incredible. I know there's not a uh, one answer fits all solution here, Matt, but is, is, is that a viable option to just go, right? This quarter has been a mess. I've learned from my mistakes. I'm not just going to go chasing people down. I'm going to spend this quarter now getting my pipeline for next quarter sorted so that then we've got sustainability moving forward and less of these ups and downs. It's a really good question. I, and I think that there isn't sort of a, a perfect answer for everybody. Uh, I would say, you know, if you've got bills to pay and you still need to make money this quarter, you probably got to go try to find some deals and get closed. Uh, I think the bigger opportunity is, your, is always your future pipeline. You know, the bigger opportunity for you to not only hit your number next quarter and the quarter after that, but have a chance to go from that 5% uh, commission rate to the 15, 20% commission rate. Um, you know, obviously the, 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 the earning yield opportunity is greater in future quarters than current quarters if your pipeline really sucks and you run the risk in the current quarter of pushing prospects towards a decision that they're not ready for i mean no matter how healthy your pipeline is no matter how good your prospecting is you're still not going to control when prospects are ready to close that's why you have to have a bigger pipeline because things happen um, so if all of a sudden you start getting pushy if all of a sudden you start getting aggressive to try to hit your number this quarter um, you may get a couple people to say yes, but there's a highly likely, higher likelihood they weren't ready and aren't going to be happy. And then are going to that's going to impact your brand as well as impact your company's brand. It's also likely that other people that didn't close now have a bad taste in their mouth because they didn't like the fact that you came and got pushy. And so now the relationship you have with that prospect, the likelihood of them wanting to do business with you moving forward actually just went down as well. So I think that the more aggressive you are to try to hit a current number unnaturally, creates collateral damage for future quarters. Um, and I think if you spend time chasing that, it also takes away from time you could be using to spend to, to, to get to your next number. Because if you spend the next couple of weeks trying to hit that number, your pipeline is still going to suck come day one <laughs> of the new quarter. And then yeah. you're still you're behind there as well. So um, sometimes I think to your point, it is, you know, look, if you're having a bad quarter, if it's toward the end, you know, just say, hey, listen, this was a miss. Um, let's just make sure this doesn't happen again. Sure. And if you explain that to your sales manager as succinctly as you did then, and you tie it into the relationship you've got with your accounts, and especially if it's more complex B2B deals that are going to take longer uh, to close in the first place, and you're not just calling people and doing business on the phone. It's a smart move, right? And it's, it's the intelligent thing. And hopefully a sales manager would perhaps give you a slap around the side of the head, but then accept it a few seconds later. So on top of all this then, Matt, perhaps there's people listening now who go, well, I'm sick of being up and down these sales slumps. Right at the moment, I'm up in the air. We're doing well. We've got we've got buoyancy, for want of a better way to describe it. What do these individuals need to do every day, once a week, once a month to continue a consistent path rather than having these huge fluctuations and ups and downs, which perhaps they've had in the past? 
I think you got to kind of unpack why you're having such a great month or great quarter and figure out how much of it is because of uh, factors and tactics that you can repeat and how much of it was uh, random. Like if you're having a great quarter, you're like, this is fantastic. I'm going to do this again next quarter. But if you realize that 40 percent of your deals fell on your lap, that just were, you know, just, you know, the right place at the right time that, you know, or, you know, you had a trade show this quarter where you met a couple of your prospects. But that's a trade show that happens once a year. So I think to, and put another way, what can you do to increase your confidence that you're going to be able to repeat this performance next month through your own hard work? You don't have another trade show coming up. Let's not assume that your next big deal is just going to randomly call in like that may happen. You know, you may we may get done with this and somewhere in my inbox, maybe a customer that I've been trying to hunt down. They're like, OK, we're finally ready to go. Let's go like that may happen. But, that, you know, hope is not a strategy. So if you know that every day, if you make 40 phone calls, you make 40 phone calls today, 40 phone calls tomorrow, then you're going to hit your number. Just go make your 40 phone calls. Now, if some if 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 prospect number 41 lands in your lap from the trade show or from an email. Great. But make 40 more phone calls tomorrow because that's what you can control. Like that's what you can create some confidence around that you're going to not face those same kind of slumps the next month or the next quarter. I don't know if you've come up with this because you said it kind of flippantly there or if it's, it's, if it's a well-known kind of phrase or, or t- turn of phrase. Hope is not a strategy. That that sums up most of the problems I see in the sales <laughs> space and with individuals, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, I definitely did not come up with that. I heard it somewhere. And I wish I knew who, who who came up with it or who I heard it from. So I got to give them credit for it. But I but I, I do think that um, I mean, and this happens a lot, you know, like, you know, a past prospect happens to all of a sudden be ready or, hey, you know, marketing usually gives me crappy leads, but this lead actually worked out. Right. So, I mean, you can't as a rep who's 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 who's, you know, whose grocery bill is tied to whether or not you're going to hit your number. I don't want the marketing team to determine whether I'm going to pay my bills. I don't want the trade show and whether or not I happen to talk to the right prospect at the right booth at the right time is going to pay my bills. Like I have to go do that myself. I have to have a system that can increase my confidence that I'm going to hit that number. Everything else, serendipity, trade shows, marketing, like that's gravy. Like fantastic. Right. Um, and, and those, that may be the difference between your 5% commission and your 15, 20% bar, but like you have to be in control and you have to have a system in place that you can repeat every week, repeat every quarter to hit your number. So this makes total sense, like obvious sense. Anyone listening to this now that that was a revelation to shouldn't be working in sales. Or the this extremely... isn't rocket science, man. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah, this is not, com- I mean, if, if someone was looking for some complicated, um, system like uh, it, it's not going to come from me and I don't think it's what's <laughs> needed. I mean, I mean, honestly, like, you know, <laughs> he's, he's some of the best sales consultants I know in the industry who do a lot of speaking and writing. Um, I mean, their advice just comes down to like, pick up the damn phone, man. I mean, do the hard work, you know, have a good message, have something of value to share with your prospects. Like, don't just call them 20 times a month and say, like, where's my contract? But, you know, you do have to put in the work and, and that work is what you can control. So knowing what that is and setting a discipline for doing that on a daily basis um, is important. Having said that, Matt, I want to touch on this a little bit deeper. I want to get practical with it because the answer might be CRM and kind of software, some kind of way of documenting this. But say like we're in this, we're in this high at the moment, we can suss out the one, two deals, like what dropped into my lap. Um, I think it was last night it came in. I saw it this morning. This this brand that wants to sponsor the show for two years and do other things on the back of it. I didn't prospect that. They just came in. They clicked a link at the bottom of our website and, you know, hurrah, awesome. It's going to be amazing. So putting those to one side, how do we start to suss out, how, how to phrase this, how, how do we suss out then the the people that we have got control on and to work backwards so then we can suss out we need, we need to make 20 calls a day to make that number if if we take marketing out of the equation if we're only looking at the opportunities that we've got control of how do we document this how do we set this out in a spreadsheet is this a piece of paper is this you have to do this six months kind of through your crm and then run a report at the back end of it how do we suss out what our top customers are and, and the ways we can kind of bring them in and, and have control of all of that so that's a whole nother, probably a whole nother show to walk through all of that. I, I will, for those of you that are watching the video, I'm going to, I'm going to put up here. This is, it's laminated because I travel a lot and I want to have a copy of it. This is equal. I see at the top. This is my, I call it my daily do list. 
Um, so it's Matt's daily do list. And I update this a couple times a year. And this is a list of the things I need to be doing on a daily basis to build my network and to build my pipeline. Um, and some of it are lead follow up. Some of them are content related content sharing. Some of them are, um, you know, I've got some systems that give me some trigger events and buying signals and here's prospects that were in the news or were quoted somewhere. Um, and then I've got a set around sort of I've got some a set of named accounts. And so, you know, some triggers and some some uh, reminders to follow up with them. Um, but if I didn't have this, I wouldn't do this. You're right. And that sounds kind of simple, too. But like if, if I didn't have a checklist. And if it was just like coming in the morning and, you know, my job is to prospect, well, what the hell does that mean? Like, <laughs> that is not specific enough. Like, I need to know, okay, like, I'm going to take that list from the trade show and I'm going to make 10 more phone, phone calls and then do the next 10 people tomorrow and the next 10 people the next day, right? Um, or, you know, I'm going to say, okay, it's, you know, every day I'm going to run a report in CRM that says, show me anybody where I haven't seen activity in 30 days or more that's in my territory or on my target account list. And every day there's going to be people on that list and every day there's people you can now go and follow up with, right? And so, you know, some days there may be five people on the list, some day there may be once and maybe 20. But like that's a specific report you can run every day. And you know what your follow up is. You know what your strategy is. So you have to get to that level of specificity, because if, if 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 I tell any salesperson you need to be prospecting today, or even if I tell them you need to make forty phone calls today, who do I call and what do I say? Like that ambiguity breeds complacency. And if we don't have something specific to do, we're less likely to do it. And that sounds sounds you know obvious as well. But like you have to have like here are the things you should be doing today. Um, so you actually get them done. So let me get this straight because I think I've asked one question and you've answered my next question here of the simplest way to avoid overwhelm with deciding the tasks that we should be doing each day. And, and this is, you know, we're all relatively stupid when it comes to stuff like this. As soon as we get to the office, if there's a list, we can sit down, we can do it. it makes total sense. We can time block, which we've covered on the show before, all these kind of things. The way to source out how to win is it to hypothesize, I need to do 20 calls a day, see where that gets me in four or five weeks time and how many deals are closed versus the way I was going to attack it. But this seems a lot more simple and easy to implement. The way I was going to attack it was to reverse engineer what's worked in the past and then try and funnel down to the numbers and then work from that. Does that make sense? I think I'm overcomplicating. Yeah, well, I think here. those are complementary. Those are very complementary, right? I mean, if you if you look at the last month and the last quarter and you say, what what led me to that great quarter, you know? Um, and I think if you can identify the things that are repeatable and as predictable as possible, those become the foundation of your plan moving forward. I mean, if part of it was, you know, I actually went and did my own prospecting, I did my own call calling, I did my own follow-up and that became 80% of my, my number or 40% of my number. Great, that's a great starting point. If 25% if of your pipeline or your deals came from marketing leads, well, that's great. And hopefully marketing will continue to generate leads. But what if the next lead set of leads are crappy? What if they don't what if they lose their budget? What if they don't what if the next campaign they do doesn't work as well as last month's campaign? Right. So, I mean, as look, and, and this is this is coming from a marketing guy like we run a marketing agency. But I think like if you're in sales, you need you need to have control and you need to have a plan that you have confidence that you're going to hit. And so um, I think if you can unpack what's worked in the past and translate that into specific steps of what to do moving forward, that's at least a starting point. That makes total sense. And I feel like there's a follow-up episode, follow episode to this, Matt, of what we do once we know the gist of things and how we can refine it and perhaps how you can put a, a marketing hat on some of this, how you can make it, because you keep using the word uh, repeatable, predictable, and they're not words that I associate with complex B2B sales. So I feel there's an op the opportunity for a, a future episode to dive into how we can extract the a measure and use data to get the repeatable elements of this, and then we can double down on them, right? So perhaps we can cover that in the future. What, you know, I don't care how complex your sale is. I don't care how complex your product is. I mean, it may be something that people don't buy in days or weeks. Maybe they don't, they, you know, the, the sales cycle are in quarters or, you know, if you're selling into the, you know, the public sector, selling into government, your sales cycle may be measured in Olympics, right? I mean, it may be long and complicated. But what you do next is by definition not. The, the next step is a phone call. The next step is an, in, is an email. The next step is... Um, you know, something on a social channel. The next step is, you know, p finding some content that someone needed or someone's going to want to see or that's going to help reframe a problem that they have. The next step, by definition, is very tactical and very simple. 
So you so it, it can be overwhelming if you think, wow, I need to I need to go find deals and these deals take months to close. And there's eight members of the buying committee and I have to get them all building consensus. OK, fine. Where do you start? What do you do right now? Who, OK, if you know that your entry point is tends to be a director of I.T., great. Who is the director of I.T.? What is her phone number? What is her email address? Where did she go to school? What's interesting about her? What's something that you now know about her by doing three minutes of research that you can use in the context to follow up and send an email? OK, sit down and write the email. I mean, the, these are all the tactics you, you have to start by doing specifically those very tactical, specific things. And, and if our math is right, you do that 40 times a day. You're going to hit your number. Matt, we'll wrap up with that, mate, because that is the most succinct, practical non-bullshit advice that we've had on the show in a long time and i really appreciate that just going sure. next step and there's there's some um so i can't remember who it was now I'll, I'll butcher it i'll put it in the show notes if i can find it but there was some uh oh what's her name there was an actress long story short and she said essentially what you're describing here about depression it's not something that i've ever faced or or, or really i've never really had friends that have come across it and, and battled with it either but essentially her thoughts were you know, can you survive today? What are the next actions you need to implement and then kind of start the game again tomorrow? And that's how she got through it. For some reason, those kind of wires uh, connected there. So anyone who is listening to this, who is in a bit of a sales slump at the moment, perhaps that's how you can potentially pull yourself out of it and, and put yourself in a practical mood to take action today by looking at that next step. With that, Matt, with all this sensible advice, for everyone who wants to you know, look at you, your background, what you're doing, the company, everything else, tell us where we can find out more about you, mate. Yeah, I appreciate that. You can find us at HeinzMarketing.com. It's H-E-I-N-Z, like the ketchup, marketing.com. Uh, you can get me at just Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at HeinzMarketing.com. And um, you go to our website, we've got a ton of content. So our sales, marketing, uh, most of it's B2B, uh, all of it's free. So um, in, any kind of questions you have, um, feel free to give me a call or check up the website and see what you can find. Good stuff. Well, I'll link to all that in the show notes to this episode over at salesman.org. With that, Matt, again, I, I appreciate the practical advice here because even I haven't done... I think 400 out of these shows now was trying to overcomplicate this. I was trying to push you for a complicated answer and I appreciate the fact that it was just so simple, mate. Uh, simple, action-based. And with that, I want to thank you again for joining us on the show. Thanks, man.